That's okay. Great. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Is this on? It's okay. Uh, for the very kind welcome, indeed, for the invitation um, to come speak here. I have to say this is not a topic that I think I've ever spoken on before or really researched. I've always believed focus on the terrorists and less how the phenomena is studied. But when my very old friend and former student, Andrew Strindberg, asked me to think about this subject. And you can recognize my former students in the audience. We all have long beards, except for Danica Newley, uh, who's the only one in the audience who doesn't. Um, I began and spent, I think, a very profitable, very frustrating and angry seen summer, basically two months leading, reading through all the critiques, um, all the studies of the study of terrorism to arrive at a consensus through my own perspective and through my own reflections, basically, on some of the challenges of studying terrorism. And of course, countering violent extremism is included in that. And then to reflect on, it's rare that I can say these things these days, but I'm probably, I'm not probably looking out there. I think I am the oldest person in this room. So perhaps one of the reasons Anders also turned to me is that I've been studying terrorism now for over four decades and at least have something of a perspective. Uh, I've, my, throughout my career, I've alternated between think tanks and academe, and right now I'm both in a think tank and still at academe. I've done short stints uh, working in the government, uh, the Department of Defense, uh, the Central Intelligence Agency, um, the FBI as well. Uh, for a quarter of a century, I've edited a scholarly journal. I also edit um, a university press series. So I have something of a perspective, at least I hope, uh, at least a deeply personal one, of the field, um, where it's gone and, and where it's, it's, it's going. In looking at the study of terrorism, you almost have to ask the question, what is the purpose of it? And this seems self-evident, but in point of fact, it isn't, because at least you can boil down two very different perspectives in the approach of the study. The one that's the more traditional or also call, called orthodox, which obviously geriatric individuals like myself affiliate with, um, I think, very simply put, is to better understand why persons do what they do, why they have chosen a path um, to violence. And of course, this traditional perspective reflects very much a realist approach to the study of international uh, relations that sees terrorism as a threat to the state, uh, to the established order, and increasingly, as we've seen, to the international um, system. Of course, on the other side, and development over the past decade or so, has been the emergence of critical terrorism studies, or CTS, constructivist approach in international um, relations, is concerned very much with enhancing and enabling the emancipation of oppressed peoples throughout the world who are suffering under the uh, status quo and hegemony of the Northern Hemisphere, and that also take a very different approach in engaging with and interacting with anyone in government, defense, law enforcement, or intelligence. In fact, it's got to the point where many think it's, it's actually uneth unethical. And I think these distinctions are very important in the field of terrorism, because firstly, it de determines what and who is studied and how they're studied, as you'll see in this uh, presentation. It raises questions about the ethics of policy-relevant research, especially when it is seen as strengthening the institutions of the state, which from my perspective is not an entirely bad thing, um, and of the powerful arrayed against the powerless. Where it gets more complicated, I think, are some very pertinent questions raised about objectivity and what is objectivity in the study of terrorism, and I think that's enormous consequential for the research results. And also, I think, all to the good, the critical terrorism studies approach has challenged some of the core or fundamental assumptions of the very field um, itself. Now, in thinking about this paper, it occurred to me, just as we're the product of our parents' DNA, we are also the outcome of our academic mentors' DNA, especially in graduate school. And in my case, this is very heavily determined, as I'm sure this may be the case with many of you, your approaches to the study of any field, but particularly terrorism. Um, I was a graduate student. Um, there was electricity back then. But nonetheless, it's a long time ago when international relations, in fact, was taught very differently. My supervisor during my first graduate degree, 
is someone who's largely lost to the sands of time, Professor Headley Bull, author of, I think, one of the seminal books of international relations theory, the anarchical society. Um, he was a philosopher by training. When I studied theories of international relations under him, it was completely different than the way I teach my students to study it at Georgetown. We engaged with Kant, Hume, Grotius, and other ph philosophers. Um, but he himself, I think, especially because of this philosophical background, and especially because of his approach, had a very interesting, and back then, somewhat unique career trajectory. Uh, he left the Australian National University, he was an Australian national. His first teaching post was at the London School of Economics, but then several years later, because of his involvement in what was then the Institute for Strategic Studies, is now the International Institute for Strategic Studies, or IISS, uh, was appointed director of uh, the British Foreign Office's Arms Control and Disarmament Agency, and he spent four years there before returning to academe, first at Australia Nath National University, and then as the Montague Burton Professor of International Relations at, at Oxford. So he was one model. The other model, uh, unfortunately, Professor Paul passed away uh, 34 years ago. Remarkably, uh, Professor Sir Michael Howard is still alive at 97. And I don't think it's, it's too much of a stretch to say that he's probably the 20th and 21st century's version of Clausewitz in many uh, respects. Uh, a decorated combat veteran from World War II from the Italian campaign where he was uh, decorated for gallantry and injured. Uh, after World War II, he became a lecturer in the history department at King's College London. Uh, went on to found what is today the IISS in 1958. Four years later to found the Department of War Studies at King's College. Returned to Oxford where he was successfully, successively reader in higher defense studies. Profe uh, Chichely Professor of the History of War, and then the, the apex of the history field in the United Kingdom, the Regis profes Professor of Modern History appointed by the Queen. Um, throughout his career, he was consulted by and consulted with prime ministers, presidents, secretaries of state, defense, and various ministers. And they really, at least from my perspective, instilled in their students an ethos of real-time engagement um, in the policy world. They both underscored that scholarship is time-consuming and painstaking, especially when it involves detailed, systematic archival work. They instilled in their students a dedication to the building of institutions and of academic programs, not just of being scholars, but of actively contributing to the community and training a new generation of scholars and policy pra practitioners. Uh, but I think what I really took from them throughout my career, and again, one is a philosopher, one was a, an historian of war, was the belief that a complete, that the only accurate or even complete understanding of contemporary international relations and national security could only be derived from policy engagement and through knowledge and indeed experience of how government military the intelligence community and law enforcement operate. If we were philologists or um, uh, semioticians or literature specialists, we could remain ensconced in the academy in the ivory tower. But given the nature of our field, at least what I had taken from my mentors in graduate school was a career of engagement where you had one foot family firmly planted in the academic and the policy worlds. However, there's an immediate because at least in my 30-year uh, career in, in academe, what I've, what I've found is that this is not something that's valued. Even at the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University, I mean, those words itself would seem to indicate a school that's very professionally oriented in preparing students for careers in government, which it is. But there is also this tension between whether one should be engaged in the policy world or whether one should be completely divorced and cut off from it. And perhaps one of the seminal explications of this in the field of terrorism studies was written in 1988 in a book titled Political Terrorism, uh, edited by uh, um, Alex Schmidt and Albert Youngman, where they very famously stated, this has been repeated many times since, that the terrorism researcher should not confuse his roles. His role is not to fight the terrorist fire. As a firefighter, rather he should be a student of combustion. And I've never quite understood that. Does that mean that you shouldn't be 
actively developing or contributing to policy discussions that counter terrorism? Or does this mean that you should not be doing so contemporaneously, that you can study for a period of time and then shift into actual policy formulation and implementation roles? And this was never made clear. And of course, Schmidt and Youngman's own careers make that even more um, perplexing because having said that, only a few years later, Schmidt entered into the United Nations, where he was Officer for the Prevention of Terrorism and a Senior Crime Prevention Officer, uh, where he stayed for uh, six years. And then Youngman himself went into Dutch military intelligence, where he served from after 9-11 until, until 2012. And I don't think that process it is, all, is at all uncommon. I don't necessarily think it is a bad thing. However, when we look at some of the fault lines in terrorism today, not surprisingly, when Alex Schmidt succeeded myself and Magnus Ransdorp subsequently to become director of the uh, Center for the Study of Terrorism and Political Violence at St. Andrews University, as he put it in a, in, a, in a memoir article he recently wrote very controversially, he sought to build that program and to actively engage with the intelligence community and with government. And he explained that the chance to talk truth to power and warn government policymakers about mistaken policies was, in my view, worth the risk. On the other hand, we have the critical terrorism studies perspective, which in fact has only become more strident and has hardened in recent years. Richard Jackson of the University of Otago in New Zealand, uh, the founder and editor-in-chief of Critical Studies on Terrorism, their flagship journal, has actually wrote that the time for any engagement on moral and ethical reasons with policymakers anywhere is completely over and that academics should completely abjure from any contact with, um, with the government given its hegemonic um, enterprise and given what has unfolded over the past two decades in the war on um, terrorism. This debate has also generated lots of questions about the nature of objectivity in terrorism uh, research. Andrew Silk, a criminologist who has written many critiques of the field going back to uh, 2001 and continuing um, since then, has talked about how not only is terrorism uh, an emotive subject, but then interestingly many researchers have traditionally not been overtly concerned with remaining objective and neutral in how they view the subject and perpetrators. Uh, perhaps in my own cynicism, I wonder if criminologists view rapists, serial murderers, and others with an objectivity. I mean, our task is always to study them. I'm not sure that studying them and understanding persons who perpetrate violence means that one has to maintain a neutrality necessarily, but th there, there you are. Um, Another argument is Jackson's, which is to say that policymakers just don't care and don't listen to academic research, and it's a futile effort. I mean, of course, we don't live in a perfect world, and one only has to look at the United States these days to understand that. Uh, and I don't even delude myself for many years of policy engagement. Of course, policymakers selectively bring on board what supports their positions and often ignores things that are at variance with it. But it doesn't mean that there isn't immense importance, even if they ignore what one is saying, in engaging them and in attempting to bring the objectivity of scholarship and indeed the institutional memory that one might have, have been uh, established uh, a track record or decades of, of studying terrorism, even if it does fall on deaf ears. It's, I think, better than the opposite. But let's let's unpack that uh, further. In concert with objectivity, criticism has also been made that government funding of terrorism research has skewed, if not undermined, agendas and aligned research with government priorities and, and um, policies. Uh, Silk, in fact, has drawn a parallel with tobacco companies funding research on tobacco use and the unreliability as everybody would recognize, of self-serving tobacco companies, comparing that to governments uh, that fund uh, terrorism research, and has also made the point that objectivity is often relatively rare in the field, which is not especially surprising when the, most of the research is paid by one side of the terrorist equation. Um, we'll come to that in a second. And then it once again raises this firefighting um, role. And then finally, in terms of questions about objectivity, that research on terrorism, especially outside the critical terrorism realm, is almost exclusively, if not, I don't think 
no, almost exclusively, I think completely exclusively is certainly an over-exaggeration, focused on non-state violence and very rarely pays attention to state, state violence, which I think is a canard, but I'll, I'll get to that. And at least when you can actually look at some hard facts, which hard facts often turn out to be dollars and cents, or at least some monetization of this. I mean, it's true since 2008, the Department of Defense's Minerva Study Project has awarded on a yearly grant basis uh, grants of somewhere between 150000 and a million dollars a year for research in the United States. In the United Kingdom, the Economic and Social Research Council has administered over a $7 million pound sterling grant to establish the Center for Research and Evidence-Based study of terrorism, uh, which is currently located at three universities, Lancaster, Bath, and uh, Portsmouth. Very controversially, the products uh, from this Crest effort have to be reviewed by the UK intelligence community, not for censorship, but to make sure that the information presented does not uh, violate um, the um, Official Secrets Act. And where I think government funding certainly in, the, in recent years compared to the first years following the 9-11 terrorist attacks has become so critical is because as any independent or private researchers of terrorism know is that philanthropic funding from uh, various grant-making uh, non-governmental organizations and private philanthropies has pretty much dried up some of the major ones no longer award money at all on national security let alone what they've come to regard increasingly as controversial issues like countering violent extremism uh, counterterrorism, homeland security and so on so there is indeed less money out there so the government funding takes on uh, uh, greater um, influence but Let's look at these from another perspective. These are some of the objections, but they rather paint the field in a broad brush. And no field is monolithic or completely unitary, not least even the traditional terrorism studies field. And I think that many of these criticisms are uh, both wrong and grossly unfair. And in fact, reflect exactly the inability to engage in the scholarly material that many of the critics um, allege. At least in my experience, the vast majority of legitimate bona fide, actual academic uh, scholars of terrorism studies are neither fascists nor war makers. And the ones that are, I have to say, are pretty much excluded from the field. They may get time on Fox News or on various, uh, shall we say, rather dodgy uh, websites and so on. But the mainstream of experts in the field, I would argue, do not conform to this caricature. Uh, in, in, in either respect, nor are they government stooges, sycophants, or toadies. What has struck me in reviewing all this literature that, that um, criticizes terrorism studies is firstly, it completely takes the easy way out and just focuses on articles published in scholarly journals, which means you can do probably the laziest approach to research possible, which is simple keyword searches, but does not look at the body of literature. Firstly, it very rarely focuses on books, but rather focuses on, uh, on articles. Uh, but secondly, and I think immensely telling, the same people that they accuse of justifying, excusing, legitimizing the hegemony of the North over the South, um, of uh, institutionally institutionalizing some of the more lamentable policies that the United States has pursued in the war on, on terrorism. When you comb through the congressional testimony of the same individuals, what Alex Schmidt referred to as talking truth to power, one finds a very different picture indeed. And in fact, of all the established terrorism experts I know, I, don't, I can't recall any of them in reviewing their congressional testimony that has not been enormously critical and attempted to challenge some of the core tenets of the US counterterrorism policy in the war on terrorism. So I think that's a complete misnomer. And let's look at sort of one of the archetypes or an individual was long seen to be the godfather, the grandfather, the creator of traditional terrorism studies, uh, Professor Paul Wilkinson, who many of us know from his years at the University of Wales, the University of Aberdeen, and then, of course, at St. Andrews. In 2007, in a, in a handbook on terrorism and homeland security that he wrote, he was excoriating in Britain's, in exposing what he said was Britain's subordinate role in going along with the United States in the invasion of Iraq, and completely candid in what he saw was an approach that was creating more problems 
than it was solving. And certainly Paul was not alone in leveling those criticisms, which were also ignored. And this was not a flash in the pan fashion where everybody, particularly in a place like the United Kingdom where the, where the invasion of Iraq was so enormously controversial politically, you can go back to Paul's seminal work, Terrorism in the Liberal State, and see going back to the 1970s, Paul enshrined the respect of human rights and fundamental civil liberties as absolutely essential in any approach to countering terrorism. And at least for young scholars of my generation, when I was in graduate school then, terror in the liberal state was a touchstone for how we approached the field. You know, the other question is how has government funding, or has government funding fundamentally compromised uh, objectivity? And here, there's a complete absence of empirical evidence. I mean, this is something that's very frequently said. I think we know that there's far more government funding in the field of terrorism, but I've never been able to find in any of these critiques any clarity, firstly, on the total amount and how that amount is actually perverting the field. No real rigorous assessments of its impact or indeed comparative analyses of government versus non-government non funded of terrorism to find out if there is in fact this problem and if there is this enormous divergence of government influence skewing research versus um, private. Some of the points raised earlier spoke of the imbalance that terrorist uh, scholars are of course going to be biased because the government is paying their way and the terrorists are not funding their um, research. Well, in my view, that raises even more fundamental questions of ethics and, and, and morality. At least governments are democratically elected, at least the governments that all of us uh, work for and accountable for the way that their funds are um, expended. And then one has to ask, fundamentally, is research in the service of policy inherently malignant? What happens when it saves lives? Uh, in my career, I know of several instances where academic research has indeed fulfilled the purpose that should be all of our purposes, which is to save lives and make the world a better place, where it's contributed directly to the denigration of, well, not the denigration, to the constriction of military operations or to the adoption of best practices, both from an historical perspective but also from an empirical perspective. Um, examination, when implemented on the ground, have enabled non-kinetic approaches to privilege, be privileged over kinetic approaches, um, and which have provided more effective um, alternatives. And at the end of the day, that's all that, all that uh, uh, matters. Um, very briefly to give you, uh, you know, people make these platitudes that's part of the problems of these criticisms is that often they're unspecific. At least uh, in, in my experience, uh, I know that the activities of one think tank heavily influenced the conduct of an air campaign and greatly reduced the prospects of collateral casualties. Um, other experiences have shown how academic research on countering suicide terrorism was implemented on the field and prevented um, an expected onslaught on one occasion in Iraq and then also facilitated the 2005 national elections in which there was not one suicide attack that disrupted those elections. So I think these, and there are many other examples of where academic research has had a far more positive effect than many people um, know. This also raises the question of whether there's a moral equivalency between governments and terrorism in this search for um, obje objectivity, especially when Western liberal uh, democracies are, are um, concerned. Uh, it's very laudable to read the critical terrorism perspective and talk about the emancipation that should be at the heart of terrorism studies and the empowerment of the powerless against the powerful. But as I said a few minutes ago, this also does not mean that we deny what terrorists are, that terrorists, understanding them is one thing, but acknowledging that terrorists commit criminal acts deliberately targeting civilians, and themselves are killers, bombers, rapists, and um, kidnappers. And this is a point that I'll come back to in a second that the Italian scholar, Alessandro Orsini, makes in his long engagement and interviews of both uh, far-left Red Brigadist and Premier Lina, as well as uh, Italian neo-fascists, makes the same point, that he said, most of them have stopped killing, not by choice. They still absolutely believe in the righteousness of their cause and tell him that they would do it again. And in fact, tell him that we used to kill professors 
as well. It's just that they've either been arrested or their groups have disappeared and they're no longer able to continue that violence. Also, as I write in the first chapter of Inside Terrorism, states, of course, commit war crimes. Civilians die in conflict, which is something we all strive to prevent and avoid. But when militaries do those things, we know that they are inherently wrong, and we often characterize them as war crimes. And here, I think there's this enormous difference between terrorists who deliberately seek out and target innocent civilians, and this comment from General James Mattis from his latest book, um, Chaos, uh, Lessons in Leadership, where he describes the operational plan that he put in place as commander of the 1st Marine Division when Iraq was invaded in 2003. And he instructed his troops, terrified civilians would be in our line of fire. I made it clear that our division would do more than any unit in history to avoid civilian casualties. Now, again, we live in an imperfect world, and that is an ideal that is not always reasoned. But in my view, that is the complete antithesis of terrorism that focuses precisely on targeting innocent civilians rather than um, avoiding them. Briefly, there are three other salient criticisms of terrorism research that I will um, briefly walk through before coming up with a conclusion. Paucity of primary sources uh, by scholars, paucity of interaction with terrorist interviews, and that terrorism studies to date has not been sufficiently explanatory or predictive. Again, I think if you focus on journal articles, you might get a very Exclusively, you might get a very uh, skewered picture. Picture, each is a canard. Uh, firstly, paucity of primary sources. One of the most enormous problems in the study of terrorism is that the field consistently for the past 30 years has been overwhelmingly dominated by political scientists. Um, and as we know, political science itself is becoming less empirical, more methodological, and far more theoretical and quantitative. This is a problem many political science and government departments, certainly in, in the United States. Secondly, the field of terrorism has always had a dearth of historians, people who actually engage in primary sources. In fact, in one of Silk's studies, uh, historians ranked about sixth behind political scientists, people in government departments, psychologists, criminologists, sociologists, and in recent years, more economists have become involved. Frankly. I'm not against that at all. This is the one thing that has always perplexed me in academe. I always thought academe should be the bi a big tent where you engage in the search for truth through a diversity of ideas and approaches. In my experience, I found that in the government and in think tanks, much more, far more than I've ever found in academe, which is one of the least multi or interdisciplinary inst inst institutions. And the problem with history is that, at least the way I studied history 40 years ago under Sir Michael Howard, it was all diplomatic and military history, which has also completely gone out of, out of favor and is hardly studied. And this idea that there's a dearth of primary sources just simply isn't true. In fact, in the 21st century, there's more archival resources on terrorism available than ever before. And what is to say? How many countries open up the archives of their security and intelligence services, like the United Kingdom does, making available the archives of the security service, MI5, um, for the past uh, 15 years or so? Phenomenal resource that you can all access from your computers at home or at work is the CIA's um, electronic reading room, an online library, which has a phenomenal amount of material on terrorism, including not obviously operational, material, but has an enormous amount of analytical material, national intelligence estimates, estimates written by the uh, Directorate of Intelligence, at least in what I've been studying, uh, certainly over the past um, 30 years. George Washington University's National Security Archive is also an enormous research uh, resource, rather, and then finally, the presidential libraries in the United States, which contain the records of the National Security Council. So if one is willing to commit and devote large chunks of time, even in this digital age, to going through archives, one can divine at least how governments interpreted terrorist threats at the time and build a picture of how they reacted and responded to them. In, uh, second canard is the paucity of interviews of terrorists, at least that are that are um, published. And this is something that uh, Hermo Hermione Toros, for instance, wrote in 2008. Field work in the study of terrorism remains the exception, allowing for scores of publications to be produced each year with little or no contact with the perpetrators of terrorist um, violence. This is not a new issue. It's something I wrote about uh, in 1992. 
Andre Strindberg, David Brannon wrote about uh, in 2001, Silk in 2001. And I think there's a, there's a difference here. There's research that in field work that's done with terrorists, but that might be, but which is not done by psychologists or sociologists, let's say, that are going with broad surveys and with survey instruments and then reporting their results. Most of at least contemporary terrorism scholars, this was a problem I would argue in the 70s and 80s perhaps, uh, have engaged with the subjects of their study but in ways that would not be recognized by institutional review boards at their think tanks or at their universities that often were serendipitous uh, or opportunistic more than organized, but does not mean that there wasn't this um, engagement. In fact, Sunday night when I was finishing up this presentation, I sat down and tried to think of, of all the organizations that I've spoken uh, uh, to terrorists with over the past um, 40 years. I, stopped at about 18. And this is yet one more very important data point and source of knowledge in studying terrorism. But unfortunately, it's not the Rosetta Stone of terrorism studies or the Holy Grail that is going to reveal to us the secrets of terrorism and enable us to solve the problems. Because many of the studies that are very critical of individuals who may not even publicize necessarily because they haven't done surveys, the research or the knowledge they've gained um, from, ter from, from terrorists have enormous weaknesses as well that often go unrecognized. And it seems to me that this this issue of, of interviews has been used more as a cudgel by the critical terrorist school to beat the traditional terrorist school than for anything meaningful. So as part of this particular effort, I surveyed um, a dozen experts on terrorism from throughout the world. Some of them are sitting in this audience. I included myself in that, in my opinion. You'll recognize many of them uh, who have done extensive throughout their careers interviews with terrorists. Um, they've interviewed terrorists, Afghanistan, Colombia, India, Indonesia, Ireland, uh, well, you can see the list there. And I think that's probably a modest list that I could only fit in that banner. And it was very revealing to get their impressions. And of course they say, this isn't the end all and be all of understanding terrorism. There are all sorts of problems in interviewing terrorists that often aren't articulated in the push from many scholars saying that we have to interview terrorists or we won't understand this. Firstly, sample bias that you believe the group of terrorists that you've had your good fortune to make um, contact with. And what scholars have emphasized to me over and over is a luxury that many of us don't have, which is of continual engagement. Uh, not just one or two interviews, but multiple interviews over the course of years before you actually acquire that um, information. I mean, you can do that, and I'll come back to this point towards the end of the presentation. If you have so stovepiped your research and you're focusing on a very narrow account. But if you're trying to have a broad perspective on terrorism, that kind of engagement becomes difficult. Inherent social desirability bias. In other words, you know, I was trained as an historian. I actually have very low faith in oral history at all. For me, the documents are everything because people have very selective memories. They often tell you what they think you want to hear. They're always going to present themselves in the most omniscient, in the best possible light either. I think terrorists are no uh, exception. In many instances, it's impossible to ask the most sensitive or the most revealing questions of terrorists. And rather than to have a terrorist interview, completely shut down, you will avoid those questions, or perhaps it takes years to get to a point when you actually can um, put them. Terrorists that have exited for groups often have an ex post facto justification that makes themselves look better than in fact they, they, they were, as often they portray the reasons that uh, they uh, joined a group. In many cases, they're answering your questions following the instructions of the very detailed guidance of their leaders or propagandists, further skewing what they uh, tell you. Deliberate selective memories, forgetfulness, outright evasion, and lies. In fact, yes, we all know that governments lie. Uh, we see this on a daily basis. I would say that terrorists are probably the only ones that lie more than governments do, at least in, at least in my experience. And then when I asked one respondent, he focused on the exact same problem whether it's speaking to government officials, especially covert operatives, spies, uh, special operators, or terrorists, is how do you weigh or give credence to testimony to those who operate in the shadow worlds and where sometimes you cannot build up a full picture of their activities and their claims. And then finally, several people 
even individuals that have been the champions or the pioneers of interviewing terrorism. More than one of these respondents said to me, I've long given up on thinking that interviews offer the truth per se, which I think is exactly the right way to look at this, is yet another tool, one that has to be treated skeptically but is far from the holy grail. Some of the problems of interviewing terrorists, Alessandro Orsini very courageously and commendably wrote an article in Studies in Conflict and Terrorism where he talked about the extreme personal toll that he suffered emotionally and psychologically from immersing himself, especially in the neo-fascist world, but also in interacting with, um, with uh, red brigadists and far left terrorists. And then I think a cautionary note, how even when you have access to terrorists or former terrorists, so in this case it was both and former for an extended period of time in a very intimate setting. This was a conference that was held in Paris in May uh, uh, 2000. This is the final report published by uh, David Tucker, where uh, terrorists who were from Fatah, former Fatah, um, the Ba separatist group ETA, uh, the FARC, uh, the LTTE, and I'm leaving out an another uh, group, met over the course of a week. Uh, David Tucker in 2000 produced this report based on our, these were all commanders or leaders, senior people empowered to speak for these organizations. Look at these three conclusions that we derived from the, I, I was present there as well, that derived from those discussions with terrorists and how completely wrong they were for everything that would follow in the 21st um, century. Uh, reasons to target selectively and limit the effects of their operations. I mean, obviously, the 9-11 attacks and certainly ISIS's rampage have counteracted that. Terrorists will likely, therefore, regard cyber terror an attractive, non-lethal weapons option in the future. We're still waiting uh, for that to happen. And then finally, the, as we all thought in the 1990s, the Internet Revolution would bring unparalleled education enlightenment to the world and that the truth triumph over falsehoods. Along that scrap heap of inconsequential or irrelevant conclusions, we have the one that this might drive terrorists away from violence. What this all says is exactly what I described on this slide. The terrorists were telling us exactly what we wanted to hear, or exactly what made them appear better. And this was involved meetings with psychologists and all types. Okay, uh, final one, and then let me move to conclusion. Lack of rigor or predictive value. Well, again, if we perhaps just read journal articles and don't even read uh, books, and I'll come back to that point in a minute, um, you might have that skewed perspective. But one advantage of having been around as long as I have is you can, is at least if you keep your mental faculties, you still have a long memory. And I thought of three studies, all released before 9-11, that all funded by government, that uniquely did have a window precisely onto the future of terrorism, the world we are living in today. This was the first report of the Commission on National Security, known as the Hart-Rudman Commission, after Senate, former Senators uh, Gary Hart and Warren Rudman. The Terror 2000 Project, sponsored by the U.S. Department of Defense's Assistant Secretary of Defense for Special Operations and Low-Intensity Conflict. That report was so accurate that it was never published. <laughs> You'll see why in a second. And then the first report of the advisory panel to assess domestic terrorist response capabilities, uh, response capabilities for terrorism involving weapons of mass destruction, the Gilmore Commission. This challenges, I think, very significantly charges of this impoverishment or polluting of terrorism with uh, government funding because each of them were enormously important. And let me just say one other thing. When we think about the core seminal works in the field of terrorism, without exception, all of them were published before 9-11. At least the books and many of the articles that I use in my teaching of terrorism over the past uh, uh, 25 years Many of them, are pre when you think of the canon of literature, and we could talk about this later, almost all of them are pre-9-11. Uh, but anyway, I want to talk about these reports. So the first one, this was the first of three reports that the Hart-Rudman Commission issued in um, September 1999. Already the traditional functions of police work and military power have begun to blur before our eyes as new threats arise. Notable amongst the new threats, in their view, were mass casualty attacks directed against urban areas. Um, now, they got that, the latter part, wrong. It was, of course, not uh, state-sponsored terrorists and a chemical weapon was not involved in the 9-11 attacks, but at least laying out the sorts of changes that we would see, and I, you can get this online, I would, I would 
read this, uh, this is obviously a very heavy uh, redaction, uh, they very accurately, almost unerringly uh, predicted 9-11. Uh, More than that, they also envisioned the challenges that would be presented by adversaries that were much more networked, that were digitally connected. In 1999, there were no smartphones back then, just to give you an idea of how primitive of time that was in terms of, of computation. Some of their other conclusions look like a retrospective accounting of the past um, decade. Growing resentment against Western culture and values will continue to drive a backlash and generate violence against the United States and the West. I mean, that's the story of the past 20 years. The U.S. will be called upon to intervene militarily in a time of uncertain alliances. Until last week, the United States military, according to the Smithsonian map, was in some 80 countries on counterterrorism missions. That's roughly about half the, uh, half the countries in the world. Even excellent intelligence will not prevent all surprises. I mean, where do we start when we talk about to the 21st century? And new foreign crises will occur replete with atrocities and the deliberate terrorizing of civilian populations, a particularly prescient observation when the civil war in Syria continues to unfold and have repercussions far from the Levant. I'm running out of time, so let me be very brief. Second study, as I said, the Terror 2000 study, which was deemed by its sponsors as so alarming and so troubling that, all right, it spoke truth to power, but as often happens, it was thrown in a file cabinet drawer and never heard of again. Since I'd been involved in it, I have one of the few copies remaining. It brought together 41 experts, former CIA, State Department, FBI, uh, as well as an ex-KGB general, uh, General Kalugan, um, Israeli intelligence agents, and scholars. Among its predictions, uh, 1993, rise of religious terrorism, and violent far-right extremism. Let me emphasize for those of you who are too young who were not studying terrorism then, that was the era when supposedly a new world order had emerged when the collapse of the Soviet Union and the end of history basically heralded the end of terrorism. I mean, this is one reason I left the RAND Corporation and went to St. Andrews University. Government funding for terrorism research had completely dried up. Terrorists would attack cities in mass transit. T two years before, terrorists would use chemical agents and most likely would be religious cults, presage the uh, Tokyo attacks. Simultaneous or simultaneity would become a hallmark on ter of terrorists to ratchet up uh, uh, the threat. And this whole idea is that the threat would increase and become bloodier in the 21st century in order to punish adversaries and acquire attention. And then finally, and then I'll move to the conclusion, was the, Gil the so-called Gilmore Commission, uh, which existed from 1999 to 2003, and several people in this room worked on, and especially worked on, this report. Where there was tremendous pressure from various individuals, particularly associated with government, to go beyond the Hart-Rudman report, which had focused, as, as you recall a minute ago, on the threat of weapons of mass destruction or state-sponsored terrorism, uh, delivering some super-terrorist blow against the United States, where this collection of government officials, uh, scholars, think tank people, were able to come up with very sober assessments of the future course of terrorism, predicting that terrorists would adopt conventional tactics to inflict mass casualties, as exactly as being the case over the past two decades, presaging the rise of lone actor terrorism and leaderless resistance, and in terms of policy relevance, when you can bring together government intelligence, uh, state and local responders, 146 of the 164 recommendations that the Gilmore Commission uh, proposed have either been adopted or implemented by Congress or the federal government. And in particular, it focused on the problem of intelligence stovepiping as undermining the national security of the United States two years before the 9-11 attacks. So basically, to conclude, I think, what we need is a big tent. And at least in my experience in the past 40 years, the best knowledge on terrorism, the most authoritative, is not produced exclusively by the academy, but is done by individuals from multidisciplinary backgrounds, working in concert and cooperation with those who have knowledge of issues that they themselves are not familiar with. In other words, drawn from government, the military, and the intelligence community. So it was very pointedly said to me when I was a rather more callow researcher, pushing back against one perspective on the terrorist threat. An individual who definitely did have responsibility said, you don't understand, you don't have responsibility. 
you don't have to answer for the consequences. And that's a perspective that I think was invaluable, at least in framing that particular research product. A forthcoming article in the Oxford Encyclopedia of Criminology by uh, my old friend Ami Pedetsor and also um, Ariel Grossman. One also surveyed all the terrorist literature, much as I did, although I did it completely independently in my survey of individuals who had interviewed terrorists. I learned about their study that's about to be published. This was exactly their conclusion, that the terrorism, that the academic terrorist community has long been hampered and inhibited by a lack or an absence of interdisciplinary s studies. When I started as a terrorism analyst, one had to be a utility player. One in the 1970s and 80s didn't have the luxury of just focusing on one account or one specific group or one region, but rather had to become a generalist. And that's something, unfortunately, that's been increasingly lost in the years of the war on terrorism. And again, I think underscores the need now than more than ever before for a variety of perspectives and approaches brought together in the study of terrorism. And of course, that stovepiping and expertise is the same in, uh, in, in communities. So to conclude, this conclusion is from Grossman and, and Pettitsor, to overcome the aforementioned challenges, researchers from various disciplines should enhance their level of collaboration. Terrorism research requires a real interdisciplinary effort. This was not selection bias, <laughs> that I found a study that agrees with exactly what I said. It's just, as I said, when I was asking Hami Pettitsor about this interviewing question, I found out that he was doing research along the same lines and had come to the same conclusion. So my bottom line, drawing on my experience of 40 years, 40 plus years studying terrorism, is that multidisciplinary research teams can produce the most insightful and indeed useful, even predictive uh, results, that these teams cannot just be from academicians who bring tremendous um, academic knowledge, institutional knowledge, experience, but are most effective when they work with people who have that real world experience, diplomats, intelligence, military officers, increasing the high tech uh, community and industry, human rights, uh, non-governmental organizations, and of course scholars as well. And then finally, what has struck me as so enormously odd is we have these two very different and very divergent approaches to the study of terrorism. Never do they talk to one another. I mean, a lot of this is a reflection, I think, from a lot of the very aggressive and condemnatory rhetoric that the critical terrorism studies persons brought to the table when they, um, when they launched uh, their, um, this enterprise. Uh, in their 10-year re retrospective last year of where critical terrorism studies has gone, they lamented that there has been this friction and tension. And there needs to be, I think, more dialogue, even within academia on this community, not only outside academe, but even amongst ourselves as well. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Hoffman, for this extremely interesting talk. As you can see, there are a whole bunch of questions who have been coming in, both on uh, research specifically, but also about your picture of the world as it is right now. So I think we're going to dive right in. Uh, let's start with this one. What do you see as the bigger threat in the West? Foreign terrorism or Islamist terrorism and why? Uh, what will the near right? future like the look like? Was it far right terrorism? Far right terrorism, yeah. Well, those of you who are at the conference again tomorrow, you'll see, actually I'm going to present a paper which will say it's both. I mean, this, is, <laughs> this is part of the problem is that for the first 15 years of the war on terrorism, such as it was, we had the luxury of focusing from one enemy in a handful of places, Al-Qaeda. Uh, certainly in recent years, it's expanded, unfortunately, beyond Al-Qaeda to ISIS. And now we've seen this dramatic resurgence of violent far-right extremism. Very different threats. One, I would argue, that's systemically organized, that poses strategic challenges to existing nation states. One that is far more amorphous and diffuse, that presents very formidable, as I'll explain tomorrow, uh, challenges to society. Because when you think about it, violent far-right extremists, violent far-left extremists, entities like incels and voluntary celibates, they don't conform to any of our conceptions of terrorism like Al-Qaeda or ISIS. There are, at least in the United States, I know it's slightly different in Europe, there are no organizations. Uh, there are no leaders. If you look at the list of mass shootings in the United States that had a political motive as opposed to, unfortunately, the tragedies at schools, which are off, often are, more often than not are apolitical, 
all those mass shootings, including Anders Breivik here, um, Brenton Tarrant in, oh, here in Norway, I should say, uh, Brenton Tarrant in New Zealand, what organization do they belong to? Whose orders were they carrying out? So this is, I think, a similar challenge, but it's different. And it's going to, I think, at a time when we are still stressed and when many people, not least in my own country, want to turn their back on the war on terrorism, forget about the nightmare of the two, two decades. In my view, the problem is, going, is becoming much more problematical and much more expansive. And the way we've approached Salafi jihadi terrorism is not going to work in, a, in approaching these other threats. What is your thought <coughs> on the current situation in Syria? How will this affect Europe in regards to terrorism? <sighs> we're, we're poised on the brink yeah, of disaster. Yeah, where to start? <laughs> we're poised on the brink of disaster. That's all one can say. ISIS will revive. Um, the ability of ISIS's external operations network will be infused, I think, by the diminution of pressure on ISIS, that at least the Kurds and Kurds supported by the United States and other military forces was, was applying. Um, the escapes from prisons are going to be problematic. Turkey, I think, has shown itself to be a completely untrustworthy untru partner in any aspect of counterterrorism, which has, I think, a direct impact on Europe as well. In my view, once Erdogan concluded that, that Turkey would never be admitted to the EU a decade ago, he went in a completely different direction, and one that's not, unfortunately, one that's not terribly cooperative or beneficial to the West, uh, to Russia and to Iran, perhaps, but not to us. And what do you think will happen during the coming week? The world is becoming increasingly <laughs> difficult to uh, <laughs> foresee. Um, you see, this is why we have to be predictive. Oh, by the way, I, I wanted to put up this uh, bibliography of the sources I consulted, or at least the sources that, not that I consulted, that were used in this presentation. Of course, the consultation was deeper. Uh, uh, I, 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 don't, I don't know. Um, I, sus I suspect that places like Al Hol, the huge uh, camp where some 70,000 women and children, the viability of these prisons is going to continue to erode and ISIS will be replenished. But not only that, I'm waiting for the time when Hayat Tahrir al-Sham and Al-Qaeda in Idlib province formally declare their alliance with Erdogan and also join the fight. And then I think uh, the challenges to the Kurds and the bloodbath that will follow will be enormous. <clears throat> this is a very interesting question. Might not the uh, blurring of lines between law enforcement and the military lead to militarization of the police? At the same time, one of the antidotes to violent extremism is said to be community policing. Well, both are absolutely right. And I think this is where academic research can be enormously helpful. Maybe not in telling what governments to do, because of course every situation is unique and every constellation of factors has to have its own customized response. But I think, in my experience, where academic research has been enormously useful in, an underlying, in, un, in highlighting or underscoring the mistakes or what went wrong. And I think historically one can see in whatever environment, Northern Ireland, or Rhodesia, Iraq, Afghanistan, where the police have been militarized has been a huge mistake. There has to be, I think, that separation between military power and what police do. They have completely different responsibilities. One uses maximum force, mm. one is taught to use mini minimal force. One is pushes civilians out of the way, the other is trained to work with uh, civilians. So there should always av avoid the temptation of, of militarization and obviously, these days, no matter what the threat is, but particularly from far right and violent far right and far left, but Salafi Jihadi, uh, the police are the first in the last line of our defenses, the first in understanding the community and being able to identify trends and perhaps to, to intercede, but also when an event occurs, that's who we're called upon to, 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 to respond and to protect us. Mm. Um, does the research on terrorist groups apply to lone wolf terrorists? That's a tough question. Um, you know, in, in some respects, this, uh, you know, this desire to come up with a profile of a terrorist and therefore with some way we can engage in counter-radicalization, I think, is, is, is being consistently a dry well. Uh, one only has to go back to West Germany in the early 1980s when they had a very finite number of terrorists in their prison, completely homogeneous, uh, all Caucasian, all Christian or Catholic, uh, all high school graduates, but many uh, university and postgraduate degrees. Um, 
The German government produced a four-volume study, Ideology and Terrorism, and based on a very small sample, <laughs> came up with no conclusion that there was ever, you know, a universal uh, profile. So I think we have to be very cautious in, in that respect. Um, each of these individuals is unique and has a unique constellation of often idiosyncratic desires, belief systems w that have actually motivated them to use violence. What we need to st study is understand is what are the co commonalities of the triggers, what is the commonalities in the way that they have been, the communications and the influences upon them, and then work to, to countering those more effectively, if not a little. I mean, a lot of this involves really greater engagement with the high-tech sector, uh, which is only very recently happening and only in response, really, to the, to, the, to, the, to the tragedy in New Zealand last year where mm. things like the online harms legislative initiative in the United Kingdom has the, uh, the social media companies extremely worried because the, leg the legislation that is likely to be introduced whenever they can focus on other things than Brexit um, would hold the uh, chief executives of social media responsible. <clears throat> Please po post more questions. There, is, there are a few more minutes. I want to ask you something that I know many researchers in here are worried about, and that is uh, difficulties in getting access to the field as researchers working also on the ground or being embedded or b working close together. Uh, one see, uh, many see that as a huge problem. At the same time, you were at the beginning of your lecture, you were you know, raising a little warning sign for that, uh, I felt. You mean in terms of field in terms work of or in terms of risks, the risks of going native, I guess. Well, um. I'm not. Well, uh, I'm not even sure that's that. That's that much the case. Now, one thing I will say in in all the year, my years of studying terrorism, within government and intelligence, I've always seen this divide between the regional specialists and the functional mm. specialists, where the regional ones tend to see these problems as less prominent than those focusing on terrorism, arms control, low intensity conflict, human trafficking see it as a much bigger problem. So I don't necessarily see that as, uh, as, as precluding field work. No, I'm just, I, it's enormously important, but it's one aspect of the study. I think that there's a danger on dwelling on it too much. The challenges are sometimes undersold when you talk about years of engagement, multiple times each mm. year is not the commitment that some scholars to commit. People don't realize sometimes the psychological damage that can happen, and that it's dangerous as well. Well, so no, I'm not against it. I think it's enormously important. But I think it's one of the many approaches we need to use and not say that the absence of that undermines the credibility or the quality of other research. Right. Another question just came in. How has the Trump presidency affected countering violent extremism, terrorism efforts? You know, interestingly, uh, and there's others here like Seth Jones who can comment on this with greater authority than myself, perhaps. Interestingly, from my perspective, on the ground, on a day-to-day -day basis, it hasn't had much impact. But I think that's because the president isn't interested in terrorism. I mean, he's interested in getting, withdrawing U.S. forces from every place in the world that they are. But think about it, and I'll give you the two examples. All these things, though, are, of course, subject to revision, and the next tweet completely may obliterate them. Also, we're talking about a very fluid development. But uh, the U which I'll t one thing I will mention tomorrow in my presentation, the U.S. National uh, Counterterrorism Strategy that was released exactly a year ago is the fourth such iteration since 2003. I think people would look at it and find it a remarkably sober, in fact, an improvement on some of the other iter iterations. Uh, it's the first one that doesn't focus exclusively on al-Qaeda. Obviously, I had to look at ISIS but very importantly looks at the threat from the Iranian uh, uh, terrorist networks and militias. But even more significantly, a document released last October 1st, a month before the Tree of Life shooting, uh, the synagogue in Pittsburgh, focused a document released by the White House and the National Security Council on the rise of far-right violent extremism, also the rise of violent far-left extremism and even single-issue terrorists like the incels. So this was, I think, a remarkably perceptive and very expansive look at terrorism for the first time. It was amongst the most complete. Just last month, the Department of Homeland Security released its own counterterrorism strategy. Again, very sober document that very squarely identifies the rise of right-wing extremism as one of the biggest counterterrorism challenges in the United States. 
Unfortunately, the acting secretary of Homeland Security that oversaw and had a particular interest in pushing this strategy resigned last week, so that's why these things are always subject to revision. But I think to date, on a day-to-day -day basis, it hasn't had much effect. In terms of the morale of individuals in the American intelligence and law enforcement communities, that's a, that's a very different issue. I mean, if you have the president ass assailing you and talking mm. about the deep sa state, I think these people have really demonstrated their mettle and their professionalism and their commitment to the Constitution by the fact that they stay on their jobs and they do their jobs e every day despite this invective. Success stories in terms of CV efforts in the US. <laughs> um. Are there any? <laughs> I mean, honestly, I think it's useful to engage in these things. I, the problem from my perspective in the United States is no one agency owns responsibility for that. And if no one owns it, it means it's done in a very piecemeal and haphazard way. It's often down to local and state jurisdictions to do um, CVE. Um, from my own experience, which is very narrow, I study terrorism more than the CVE, but um, I, and I have been to Minneapolis, St. Paul. I mean, this was an enormous problem a decade ago with young Somali men being mm -hmm. uh, radicalized and recruited to join uh, Al-Shabaab. Tremendous resources and attention were focused precisely on, uh, on, on, on Minnesota and on this city in particular. And of course, just a few years ago, uh, eight individuals were arrested and indicted for being ISIS recruiters. So I think it's still a work in progress, and I think it's something that we're still struggling to come to grips with. The key in the United States, I think, will, have, will be finally to have one agency in the lead and responsible for this, and mm. for, it to have, for it to be properly resourced rather than the piecemeal fashion that it is today. We have room for one more question, I think, uh, before we're rushing out to grab a coffee. Uh, let's, let's pick one here. Which one do you want to talk about? Uh, uh, definitions of terrorism, I think uh, that could take half an hour. Because um, we've answered a lot of these, mm. I think. I like the one that says, great keynote. Yeah. <laughs> 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 well, th I'll answer that. Would you say that violent... Uh, okay. As the world has become more global, an act of terror on the other side of the world has an effect here. Would you say that violent extremism has come closer, even if it doesn't have a direct effect here? Absolutely. I think that's one of the biggest challenges. Uh, when one thinks about it, is countering terrorism, which was never easy, was surely much easier when I first began my professional career as an analyst in 1981. Firstly, governments actually had time to think about and, and confer, get the best uh, advice from, uh, from, from, from government agencies and then make decisions. I mean, that is completely shrunk. We thought it had shrunk enormously at the beginning of the century, with the advent of 24-hour cable, mm. but as we've seen the past three years, Twitter has had a highly pernicious impact where I think one has to have a policy for an event before it occurs, and where all things are being spun for political effect more so than ever. And that's, I think, one of the, you know, this is one thing that, okay, I'll lament and complain about our perspective on terrorism, generally, not, not necessarily government, but certainly scholars, is we often forget the basics. And one of, I think, the core basics is that terrorism, among other things, but foremost, is a strategy of provocation. Terrorism is designed and conceived to elicit a response from governments. And historically, more often than not, the response is driven even more so by immediacy, by mm. concern about public opinion, future electability. And this, I think, has had the most pernicious effect, which is to say that terrorists are attempting to provoke a response that will undermine trust in elected leadership, undermine confidence mm. in those that are there to protect us and play into the terrorist hands by sowing fear and anxiety. And we sometimes completely forget about that and become prisoners of this fear and anxiety because of the news mm. cycle and because of Twitter. And I think the challenge of resisting that now is more imperative than it's ever been before. It's something so obvious, but I think it's often forgotten. Thank you very much, Professor Hoffman. This was a great, we agree compl completely with that. This was just a great keynote. And to all of you, uh, you have another time to run out, grab a coffee and get back. And we'll start again uh, at 10.20. Thank you so much, Professor. Thank you, Thank you all. Thank you.